been to a bunch of OASP New York chapter meetings over the years, uh, over the last five to seven years. It's hard to remember when it all started for me. Um, this is my first time getting to speak in front of you all, so it's sort of like graduating in a way. Uh, I work for F5, full disclosure. Uh, F5 is a maker of web app firewalls, among other things. So you may find the title of my presentation somewhat surprising. Um, however, uh, being that I work for F5, I get to see the challenges of working with that technology and dealing with web app firewall and real production environments quite often. Um, that being said, there is uh, the way we look at web app firewall now and what in the future if we want this technology to survive, how, how, how can that happen? How can this be an operationally uh, accessible and operationally consumable type of technology that still offers real application security of value? So quick rundown on the way WAFs work today and the way you probably think of a web app firewall. Um, by show of hands, how many folks have worked with web app firewall or are familiar with the technology? Okay, so the first part of this is gonna be really brief. That brief primer is, gonna, is getting shorter by the, by the breath. Um, then i uh, talk about why this approach will die and, and, and definitely should over the next uh, intervening few years. And then how it can stay relevant and, and why this new approach that I'm thinking of uh, is actually very valuable. So how does a WAF work today, right? Uh, we start by checking for RFC compliance. Make sure the HTTP protocol is well observed. Um, you know, make sure we have a proper get method where we expect it. Um, make sure that length limits are observed and we've got the right parameters where we expect them. Um, for example, here we're, we're saying HP 1.1 up here, there should be also a host header, right? So there's a, a number of things that are pretty easy to check on, make sure that things are as they should be. Um, we force valid types for the application. Hey, if this is a PHP app, that looks good. Um, if somebody tries to make a request for an ASP page, obviously that's bad. Um, pretty straightforward kind of things. Um, then we can also look for a valid list of URLs. We know that certain URLs don't exist. Um, if our application is well coded, we'll have a nice 404 pop up, but the web app firewall can uh, whitelist this as well. Um, look for a valid list of parameters, right? So parameter values are important. Uh, the web app firewall can do this, right? Uh, then we check each parameter, make sure it's the right length, the right type, uh, make sure it's a numeric, it's a string, it's alpha, uh, is our meta characters like that apostrophe allowed and so forth. And then we do that thing that we really think of when we think of web app firewall. This is sort of the last step in checking the request is we apply stack signatures, right? We look for that SQL injection, which is the first thing I had to wrap my head around as a network engineer coming into the world of application security is why would somebody do that, right? Why would somebody actually put SQL code in a username and password field? It just makes no sense to me. And then I start to realize that not everybody is uh, a good guy, right? Um, but that's where web app firewalls definitely see the most value. When I talk to uh, anybody that's working with web app firewall technology, they're, they're trying to knock out the OS top 10 and the SQL injection, cross-site scripting, all those things are, are pretty easily picked up by signatures. Um, so why do I think this technology is going to die, right? It sounds really good. All that sounds really good. These are things we want. Why would this technology go away? Um, who owns this thing? Is it, is it the network team? Sometimes it's a network appliance. So sometimes it's the network team responsible for buying it. Sometimes it's the security team. They own the web app firewall. And in the rarest of instances, the app dev team. And by show of hands, who, who's app dev in, in, in the audience? How many developers do we have? How many security folks do we have? Like your job has security in the title somewhere. A lot of those folks. And then how many network, any network folks brave enough to come to an OASP meeting? Just me? All right, got one in the back. Um, the challenge I see time and time again is that there's, can be, there's often very little agreement uh, with respect to who owns the web application firewall. Uh, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other, sometimes it's a cooperative effort. In the best of scenarios, it's a cooperative effort. And in many cases, it's one of these two teams, very rarely the, the developers that own it. And often these, these individuals were, were just like me a, a number of years back, trying to figure out how the application works, right, in, in general, and then figuring out the specifics of, of my application, right? Um, and so, so all these teams, they get together maybe, and then 
they, usually they say, not it, I don't want this, I don't want this problem, right? Every time the app changes, I gotta change this policy. Um, I, by the time I figure out how the app works, maybe the, maybe the application's changed and my policy has to change. It's, it's, it's kind of like that Sisyphus, you know, rolling the boulder up the hill and then it rolls back down on them and you gotta start over. Um, my kingdom for a WAF admin. The most successful organizations that I've seen firsthand who do a good job with web app firewall and get the most out of it, they've got a dedicated individual whose job is manage the web application firewall policy, nurse it, take care of it, make sure that any changes to the web application are accounted for, uh, that things don't roll into production without the web app firewall policy being uh, considered. And you know, we know that never happens. Nothing ever goes into production uh, code and then the policies suddenly break. Suddenly we have all these false positives and, and uh, users can't get to this application we work so hard to build and publish. Um, but these individuals are rare, right? Organizations that can afford to have someone dedicated to this task uh, are rare. It's a, uh, we know that there's a skill, sor sh skill shortage in inf InfoSec. Um, we know that uh, you know, there's a skill shortage around application security in particular. And so if I'm, gonna, you know, if I'm spending my application security dollars, is it on this individual? It might be more likely that I'm spending it on uh, secure coding practices, better frameworks to work with. Um, and so this WAF administrator, right, he's, he's frightened, right? Like every, he's got more than one application in his environment and everyone is different. Um, they all see regular change uh, and environments uh, where DevOps or similar types of philosophies are engaged, whether it's Agile or Scrum, where the applications are getting a lot of regular code pushes. And, and right now, um, for organizations where the web application is, is, is the lifeline of the business, those applications are seeing a lot of change just to introduce new features. Um, ask the folks at Twitter, ask the folks at Etsy how often they're pushing new code to try to stay ahead of the curve and keep the experience as rich and as expansive as possible. Um, and those types of environments, web app firewall, it, trying to keep up with the rate of change in the environment is, is really difficult. Now you can tell me that you can uh, start to orchestrate some of that stuff with APIs and make SDN and you know, software defined this and that all work for me and orchestrate changes in the application uh, with web app firewall policy code. But frankly, um, unlike other firewall technologies, be it network firewalls or uh, IPS, IDS systems, there's not a one-size-fits-all approach, right? The sn it's that snowflake thing. The policy has to kind of mirror um, if, if that parameter lengths and parameter types um, are going to be successfully enforced, if my SQL injection signatures or cross-site scripting signatures are going to be effective and not trigger false positives, they have to have some awareness and be tuned to some level of how my individual application works. Um, so I'm, I'm really prone to false positives uh, in, in these environments. And, and there's a lot of tweaking and tooting, care and feeding that has to go on. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty tall challenge to ask someone to tailor all those types of things that we talked about a web app firewall checking for at the beginning um, with every change of the web app firewall. And so I don't think, as, as we become more web-centric, as, as our web apps drive more and more uh, of the business, of whatever organization we're in, I think web applications are, are becoming more and more important. Um, we're looking at environments where uh, the web app code is changing rapidly, and that, what that means is that there's environments where those where it used to take 30, 60, 90 days or a year to find a vulnerability and then subsequently fix it, uh, that, that kind of model is going away. Uh, so there's less of a need to, to lean on a web app firewall in, in a very progressive environment like that, a DevOps environment where they've operationalized a lot of code change and made sure things work. They're gonna, they're gonna say, well, the web app firewall is just patching holes that we find about, but we can patch it faster in code. So what's left, right? So all that being said, what is left for WAF? If this technology is gonna stay relevant, what's left? How do we, how do we keep this technology in line or, or do, we just, do we just set it to the side and say it had its window, this is a technology that's aged poorly, um, it had its time in the sun, um, and, and, and really at this point our application coding practices and our frameworks and our operational practices have all caught up to a degree that we're pushing out really secure code. The OWASP mission has been achieved, right? So in five to 10 years, you know, our mission in this organization here in OWASP, we've, we've done what we set out to do. We've got more secure code 
the world over on the internet. It's a safer internet. Um, now, I know that's kind of utopian, but increasingly, if we're going to stay competitive with building web applications for, for uh, internet-facing environments, we're going to have to get there. So what's left? One is, is, is really start looking at what can I do to enrich the code in flight, right? So instead of looking at the code from a point of view of how do I plug the vulnerabilities, how can I enrich the code? How can I do things that would take um, developers a long time to build into the code? Uh, how, how can I add things that are one size fits all, that aren't in the snowflake theory? And here's one, right? Is JavaScript injections, right? A good web app firewall, be it mod security, be it something from, from F5 or another vendor, uh, functions as a proxy, and ha so it has an opportunity to inject things in the responses. Uh, could be things like content security policy headers, uh, which is a great way to fight cross-site scripting. It could be things like JavaScript injections, which are really great from the perspective of interacting with the browser, seeing what is going on in the browser, how is the browser behaving? Can I check to look for things that, uh, like keyboard and mouse movement that indicate a human user? This animation has crashed PowerPoint for me like three times, so. Bear, bear with me if everything dies all of a sudden. Um, so we do, uh, here is an example of a proactive check for bot. We, just, we don't even let the application see the request until it's, the JavaScript challenge has been passed by the browser. We've identified within a certain degree of certainty that there's a, an individual, an actual human user back there, and we'll allow this session to engage with us. Meanwhile, on a session by session and basis, right? So we've, we've all, if I saw a lot of security hands go up, we've all dealt with IP blacklists. How many people have dealt with IP blacklist grooming and maintenance? Uh, yeah, IP address blacklists, they seem to grow. Trying to shrink them and groom them is, is really difficult. This is a dynamic method, right? That allows us to look on a, on a request by request basis dynamically, hey, this is a bot. And so I'll, I'll block this for now. And the next time I see a request here, I'll check them again to see if it's still a bot, see if this browser is still compromised or it's uh, still a, uh, a, 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 a workstation that's been malware infected for by whatever uh, mechanism. Uh, so this is a way that, again, without really having to know anything about the application other than that there's a, a browser intended to be at the other end of this connection, I can inject some JavaScript code and start to learn things about the client. Questions about this approach? So another one is protocol compliance checks, right? This, is, this goes back to the, uh, one of the, the fundamental tenets of, of what web app firewalls do. You remember that was the first thing that I showed in my sort of what does the web app firewall do with the request is RFC compliance checks. Uh, protocol compliance stops things like slow R, so we can make sure that the, the request looks good. And this, again, is a, a, is a pretty good one-size-fits-all type of a, approach. So we don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. Protocol compliance checks are still useful. But also, we can do TLS protocol checks, right? And it seems like every time I go to uh, speak to someone about how to architect a security solution, there is a new TLS vulnerability uh, that's come out that same day. And today is no different. Uh, today, we've got uh, Logjam. And two months ago, we had Freak. And, and we're, it's, it's just a fun time to have to learn something new every three weeks or so because I care about crypto. Um, one of the things we're finding is that uh, the web app firewall, because it's got to do decryption in order to be valuable, is a good place to terminate that encryption and enforce what kind of protocols we use, what kind of ciphers we use, and that way leverage the web app firewall for more than just the application layer, but also the, the, the crypto, crypto layer, right? Uh, make sure that we're using TLS 1.2 when we can. Make sure that we're using Diffie Hellman Ephemeral for perfect forward secrecy and so forth. Uh, to ensure that we're doing the best possible job we can with cryptography. And that way, when stuff like this comes out today, logjam, you don't really care because I'm not supporting export grade ciphers, right? So I'm, or I'm, I'm on so-called zero day, I, I've got protection because I've enforced it centrally and not uh, you know, rely on a, the, the configurations on a farm of application servers. And then, again, these are full proxy solutions. Most good web app firewall solutions are. Uh, we can also... Uh, do some checking around the TCP handshake, right? Because we're, as a proxy, we can terminate that handshake. So look at the web app firewall for more than just the application layer. It would be another, and again, these are one size fits all kind of approaches where we can do some pretty generic things and fit it to all of our little snowflakes in our application environment. 
Another thing we can look at is fingerprinting and behavioral analysis, right? Look to see if the surfing behavior is such that there are a lot of uniform page transitions, right? I get to the home page, and then the next page loads in one second, and then the next page loads in the next second. And that's something that a normal human user doesn't do. A human user has to read the page, find the next link they want to look for, and every page transition is, is kind of you know, lumpy, right? It's, you know, this one I looked at it for three seconds, that one I stayed there for 30 seconds, read an article, and so on, right? But when there's something that's hitting, you know, cr basically crawling your site, the page transitions tend to be very uniform because, you know, robots do what they're programmed to do and, you know, loops uh, uh, are easier to do when, when it's done on a very uniform uh, interval. The other thing, so that's a non-human surfing pattern, but we also want to detect flood attacks against uh, so-called heavy URIs, right? Things, heavy URIs being things that tax the server, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but we also want to fingerprint the client, right? So the, every browser, so we talk about applications being snowflakes, every browser is a snowflake. Um, basically, the only time two browsers look alike is when uh, you unbox, say, two brand new MacBooks side by side. You just went out and got the new MacBook, the new underpowered MacBook in that nice uh, gold uh, case, and you opened them up and loaded Safari for the first time, and those browsers will fingerprint very close to one another. But the second you start surfing, getting cookies, things loaded into your HTML5 storage, um, any kind of browser extensions you add on, suddenly your browser becomes very, very unique. It's kind of like uh, CSI where they say, well, we got the DNA sample and we're certain within uh, one in a billion or one in a million that this, this is a DNA match, right? That there's only, you know, chance of, you know, small degree of error that this could be anybody else. Uh, and this, again, goes back to how, you know, IP address blacklisting, whitelisting doesn't, is not terribly manageable, kind of like signatures, uh, not terribly uh, useful. So here's a way for us to leverage the web app firewall to tell me, in a centralized location, here's the, here's the fingerprint of a user that's moving, a potentially malicious user that's moving from IP address to IP address to IP address, uh, maybe trying to anonymize themselves, maybe trying to uh, elude any kind of blacklist because the, they're, they're doing something bad. Uh, and again, this is something that uh, through JavaScript injections and other detection mechanisms, we can actually look at each browser uh, in, a, in a very unique light. Um, I would recommend, um, a site from on the uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, called Panopticlick. So it's panopticlick.eff.org, and I should have I meant to add it to the slide and I didn't. Um, but this is a place where you can actually see each of your browser's fingerprints, and it'll tell you within a degree of certainty what the what they feel the uniqueness of your browser is. Uh, and it's really eye-opening to me, right? I, I first th saw things about browser fingerprinting, and I thought, well, how unique can my Chrome on my OS X on this version be? Uh, from, from another individual's running essentially the same setup. And you know, even without any kind of uh, extensions or customizations, it, it's very, you can develop a very strong degree of uniqueness. And it's, it's one thing for me to stand here and tell you, it's another thing for you to go check a, a, a third party site and see just how unique a, a browser fingerprint can be from a way to assign risk and uh, a score to the client mechanism. So mod security has a really good uh, mechanism uh, in WAF where they ne don't necessarily have to block you when they see a SQL injection attempt or a cross-site scripting attempt or some other malicious attack. They can just actually accumulate a score on a client session and when you reach a certain threshold and say, you know what, I'm not sure if this was a, an actual SQL injection, it might have been a false positive. I'm not sure if this was an actual cross-site scripting. I'm not sure if this was actually you trying to do a remote command execution. Um, but in sum total, you're doing a lot of bad things and I just don't want, I just don't want to do business with you anymore, right? I, I don't want to conduct any more transactions. So that's a way to sidestep some of that problem of, hey, maybe I have a false positive around the signature. And when you combine that notion with client fingerprinting, now I have a way to keep that risk score and have it follow an individual uh, no matter whether they change their IP address or not. And this is, again, things that are very, uh, you know, application independent, right? I can, I can apply these much like I would other types of firewall and intrusion detection technologies. So what's a heavy URI, right? This is a, this is a big one. Um, and, I, and I just wanna do a little bit of a case study on, on how these are being exploited today because I don't hear a lot of talk about it um, in the industry as a specific area of, you know, something I have to be conscious of as a security practitioner. Uh, what do I need to protect? Uh, it's really, it's any URI that uh, 
upon a legitimate request, you know, no SQL injection, no command execution, no, no actual OASP top 10 type of uh, uh, attack attempt. Um, what it is, it, it's a legitimate request that either generates a, a, a large payload and or uh, a long response time, which indicates maybe it's taking the application a little bit longer to compute that response. Um, ramping up the, 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 the compute and the, and the resource requirement to serve up that response. So these things um, are a little bit insidious, right? I can't nail you down for doing something necessarily bad, um, and I can, can maybe detect that you're, I'm seeing too many requests from you, but it's very, very hard to pin this down as a bad request that I have to block, especially when I have legitimate users um, actually trying to access these URLs. So if we want to look at this, this, is, became, this actually became something that was done um, back uh, in the wave of attacks back in 2011 and 12 against the financial services, where there was a lot of profiling and network reconnaissance, which at the time was, was fairly sophisticated. Um, but what they've done now is, is basically script these. These are scripted things where they enumerate your whole site, which URLs accept a post, which ones accept a get, um, how, how you know, which ones return the largest file size, which ones have the longest time to last byte. Uh, and that way they identify uh, what are the heavy URLs? What are the things, if I hit them repeatedly in a way a regular user, a legitimate user wouldn't, um, can I actually hurt the application uptime by exhausting compute resources? So let's take a look at this in practice, right? So if I'm going to use network reconnaissance uh, to execute a, a layer 7 denial of service attack that's not going to fill up your internet link, um, let's do it with post, right? And post is fun because um, We'll do, the, we'll do that enumeration with a simple wget script. And, and there is an OWASP HTTP post tool that I wrote, which is on the OWASP website, that you can download the quick button right there. So, so Tom is arming our adversaries uh, as best he can. And so he, if you didn't hear, there is a tool on OWASP.org that enables you to, to programmatically uh, seek out the post accepting URIs. Is that? Yeah. yeah. The OWASP HTTP post uh, uh, tool, which is for uh, uh, the OWASP HTTP post tool. Uh, so check that out. And once we've determined that, the cool thing about a post is that it bypasses CDN protections. Because generally, if I want to post something, it's, the response is not cacheable. Um, so it's got to go all the way to the origin data center. So I can fingerprint the TCP stack at the origin. I'm no longer, you know, through Akamai or LimeWire or whomever, uh, LimeWhite, LimeLight, LimeWire. I always screw that up. Um, been around the internet too long. And so I can fingerprint the application and now I'm getting a real sense of the application uh, without you know, any kind of layer of CDN protection in between. Um, so this is a really good example of things that uh, with, without more advanced type of uh, interaction between the, the web app firewall or some other tool um, or, or better you know, or, or security extensions to the framework of your applications, there's, there are things that are really hard to detect, and if someone really, really wants to DOS you, they're going to do their homework. They're going to use tools that we make available for capacity planning and bend them to evil purposes, and then, you know, be able to execute an attack that no amount of, um, you know, conventional mechanisms are going to be able to protect. So, uh, where I see the value here is we have these emerging attack types, these emerging threats that are getting harder and harder to stop by simple whitelist, blacklist type of things. And the options are either build the application stronger and build this type of intelligence into the application, or leverage some other tool that can do this in a commodity fashion for, on behalf of the application in, a, in an agnostic fashion. Tom. Just to touch on it, you talked about the recent which is SSL hack I haven't, uh, I'm not versed. Do the one way handshake for SSL to cause the same condition. Ah, yes. So, so Tom's referring to uh, SSL half connect where you're not, you're not completing a hand, SSL handshake and causing a, a race condition. Again, um, this is another way, again, as a web app firewall, it's a centralized point for decryption. You can actually enforce uh, on some web application firewalls, you can enforce the fact that uh, a sort of a half open SSL connection, just like a half open TCP connection, can be something that's terminated after a certain time out. Um, this is harder to configure because it's such a fine grained setting. Um, 
on the server side, whether it's Nginx or Apache or what have you, you have to dig into all the servers and make sure that setting is set so that it doesn't time out. When you have a, something that's doing centralized decryption uh, or centralized TCP handshaking or so forth, you can develop a better big picture view of what's going on. And uh, there is a, a, a tool by what Tom's saying that will let you determine whether or not you're vulnerable uh, to a half open SSL uh, connection or, or handshake. And I don't know if I went really fast or if time just flew for me, um, but that is my last slide and I am open for questions. Uh, this, this presentation was actually inspired by an article I wrote for Information Security Buzz a couple months ago. Um, of course, the video and, and the, the slides from today will be made available, uh, but if you want to read a little bit more what, ins what got me thinking about, hey, maybe you want to give a talk on this, uh, I did write this article, um, and, and that's, that's where really where the inspiration came from. And, and really the inspiration for the article came from all the operational challenges I've seen uh, customers of F5 encounter as they try to adopt web app firewall technology because they have very legitimate concerns about OASP type top 10 type of issues. Any other questions, comments? I've lost my mind. No, thank you.